you'll not hear too much techno babble, I hope. But what I am here to talk about is building dreams, building dreams of scale. And if you've heard anything tonight, what you've heard is dream building takes teams. And the bigger the dream, the more people that have to come. And often, the bigger the dream, the more people we touch, the more lives we change. But especially in large global corporations, dream building, change, it's challenging. It is not easy. And as we think about everything that's entailed in building dreams and making dreams come true, a lot of different concepts come to mind. Perseverance was noted earlier. Passion, vision, all of these are essential to the common and extraordinary dream alike. And the bigger the dream, the more intense the challenge of being able to share these concepts, of being able to have them become real, not just for you, but for everyone whose life you seek to touch. Potentially the most challenging one is change. Because we as humans, if you haven't noticed, really don't confront change with the type of appetite you might expect. It's hard for us. It's an intellectual challenge. It causes emotional upheaval. And in some cases, it even provokes spiritual agony. Because in a lot of cases, one person's dream actually forces everyone's life upside down. So as you think about making your dream come true, as you think about building that team around you, there are a lot of techniques, there are a lot of things you have to think through, especially when you're thinking through how do I get that person who doesn't understand, who doesn't share my vision, or simply doesn't want to come on board, who you need to have come on board, or else your dream will fall flat? A lot of different things, but maybe the hardest is keeping with simplicity, staying simple, and translating your dream into a powerful yet simple vision to drive change, to inspire change across the community, across the organization, or potentially even more broadly than that around the world. I had an experience one time when I worked for British Telecom where we spent practically years admiring the problem and taking on the challenge that our CEO had given us. He challenged us with the idea of transforming our customer experience. We debated a long time exactly what he meant by that. We had all sorts of metrics, all sorts of objectives, all figured out. In fact, if you looked at it, one of the characteristics of our organization, 100,000 plus of us around the world, we prided ourselves in having multiple processes for everything that we did such that we could practice them and get good at them. And each of those processes we measured with a lot of different measures and metrics. In fact, we got so good at that measurement that we began to score just exceptionally high until you went and asked our customers. Our customers disagreed with us just dramatically. We said we were up here, and our customers said, we don't recognize that company because you are down here. We spent literally years arguing over this. In fact, for some, it became practically a second career. Until our, C <clears throat> our CIO said, stop. He said, look at this from the customer's perspective. The customer of all of our processes only cares about two. The first one is, from the time that you introduce me to a service until you can provide it to me, that's one process. The second process is recognizing that it's a complex and real world. When things go wrong, how long does it take you to notice and fix it for me? Two simple processes replaced all of the processes that we had in terms of how we thought about them. 
Not only that, he took us one step further and said, and actually, if you think about it, the customer only cares about two things. The first, how long did it take? And the second is, once you got done, was it right? And did you do it at the right time? So after years of study, we were finally able to start making some traction because we had found simplicity. And driving change is so hard, even with simple objectives, because sometimes the dream that you dream is not readily understood by those around you. In fact, one of the things, even with simplicity, sometimes you have to go out there and find the need and explain the person with the need or the group with the need, here's how we're going to take and satisfy your need. And being able to translate the need of an organization or of a person into here's how we're going to take care of it is one of the most important aspects of being able to invite that person on your journey, to live your dream with you. In fact, had an opportunity one time where we had this dream of taking the internet from what was at that point just a web experience, largely for consumers, academics, students, fairly early on, we said, actually, the internet will one day transform business, which in hindsight, it absolutely has. But at that time was completely foreign to the telecom operator in Italy. And they had a very broad global presence. And they said, we don't need that. But you know what? We would like to get more innovative. So we worked with them for a while. In fact, we actually ended up doing almost everything for them along this journey, writing their business plan, creating their product, training their operations teams. And eventually, they gave us the opportunity to actually change their planned innovation into a global transformation to move their traditional frame relay network, some mumbo jumbo, into an IP network. And we were one of the first to do that on a global basis. It was quite exciting, but more importantly, it gave their customers a future that they otherwise would not have had. Okay. And we did it in a way as well that we were able to do it with their existing employees. We didn't require that they went out and buy a completely new company. We kept it along the lines of what they did day to day. We didn't force a dramatic change that would cause them to have to reinvent themselves. Okay. And that's actually one of the second and most power, that's one, the third technique that I'd suggest. Keeping it natural so that you don't abandon those that you actually seek to drive through that change. But more importantly, if the humans around you don't recognize that they have to change while they're undergoing the change, sometimes they forget to fight against that change. But more importantly, they'll often get there a lot faster if it's natural. Early, in fact, one of my first jobs was a really unique experience where I got to serve as part of the Iraq action team of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And the task that we had was to introduce the first digitization of the trip reports, the videos, the photographs from the inspector's visits after Gulf War I of all of the nuclear and chemical facilities across Iraq. And at first, the inspectors were fantastic. We've got a new filing cabinet, right? And that's what it was. It was just a lot of work to get that digitized. And so we struggled figuring out how to make it real for them. And as we began to understand the challenge that they were working through, it became clear one of the biggest challenges was simply correlating the data. We had thousands of pictures, hundreds of documents, more information than anyone could get through with one fundamental challenge. Every single site visited typically had multiple names in Iraq. Each country took each of those names and transliterated it differently. And the world community debated a lot which, which site was which. 
And as we looked at it, we realized, in actuality, there's one thing that is completely unambiguous about all of these sites, and that is the location. So we turned it over and said, let's associate all of this data, not to a name, not to a database entry, not to the even more arcane identifying number that we almost went to, and we simply said, let's organize it around the places. And let's give the researchers access to a map that they can simply go to. And that worked quite well. In fact, one of the biggest challenges you know, for me was the head of the Iraq action team was a re retired professor from Rome. And the professor, when I started with him, he said, I'm so pleased to see that you're bringing this fantastic new technology to us. But I'll tell you now, I've never touched a computer in my life, and I will never touch a computer. I will die without touching a computer. Okay? So needless to say, I took that as a challenge. Okay? And we had a situation one time late in my tenure there where the world press proclaimed that the UN had missed the smoking gun, and they had found it. Now, nothing made the inspectors more irate than that type of coverage. So one day, he and a host of the other inspectors came into the room where I worked with a picture, and he said, I need you to show me where this picture is. And I hadn't a clue. We had thousands of pictures we digitized and placed in. So he was saying, I think it's here, I think it's here, and he was trying to get me to go there. Finally, he elbowed me out of the way. He said, how does this work, looking at the mouse? Little joyride there, we taught him how. Six clicks later, he was into it. He pulled up the exact same picture, printed out the trip report, in fact, the five or six of them, and went out, issued a statement that went something like this. We actually did visit this site five or six times. Each visit, we validated that it was, in fact, the dairy facility it had been purported to be and had nothing to do with the nuclear complex. All done. Right? From that period forward, he became a very staunch ally as to why it was important to not just view this as a filing cabinet. And that was very exciting for me. And it taught me another lesson. And that is, in change, you've got to find an ally. And it doesn't have to be the leader of the team. It doesn't have to be the CEO of the company. Those are all helpful sponsors. Okay? But in some cases, they aren't even the best sponsors. Because we're, as people, we're funny. Sometimes we actually like to have the validation of our peers more than our leaders. And in fact, as you're working to drive change and to create your dream and bring other team members along, sometimes the most effective ally is one sitting beside you, sometimes even one more junior. And the type of change advocate that I often like to find are those that sit at the intersections of those informal teams, informal networks, and informal processes that actually make a company go. We all have our hierarchical, our hierarchical structures, our top-down, we have our outside consultants, we have our experts. All of those are fantastic allies to go invite and engage. But sometimes the most effective allies in driving change are those that simply sit in those networks and make change happen informally across the organization. Had a team member once jointly working on a project, partnership between Concentric Network, Telecom Italia, to build a global network. And interestingly, the two partnering organizations said, we have to align to a common technology. Each of us has our own, but we'll turn it over to the working team to make a recommendation. Well, on the working team, I discovered one of the stauncher advocates for the project, an engineer by the name of Marco. And Marco, like Mikey, was a benchmark for the organization. Mikey, try it. If he likes it, anybody will like it. Marco was very much the individual that said, if you can convince Marco, I'll believe this might be for real. And so recognizing that, we actually adopted a process to make that selection that he would respect, that he would be able to say, I believe in that. And in so doing, we created a much faster outcome that let us get to the point where we were able, in the end, to make a recommendation 
that the boards of the two companies would move forward on. And that's interesting because while both at the outset stated, yes, we'll support, both were actually very vocal with their team members saying, but please just make sure it's our technology that gets just chosen, okay? So find an ally, whichever ally you can, and work within the organization in different ways, right? And I couldn't finish on this topic without actually acknowledging one other thing. It's a little risky sometimes. Not only sometimes is it important to find an ally, sometimes it's important to find an enemy. Because humans are funny creatures in that sometimes common enemies cause infighting to completely disappear. Because you focus on your opponent and you go solve the problem. So, a little riskier, especially if you pick the wrong enemy. But you have to make it real for people. Making it real for people is all about not trying to convince people on a theoretical level, but it's about as early as possible bringing it down to, you know what, this is exactly what it is. Making it so that people can touch it, feel it, work with it. Especially in large, large initiatives, we tend to like to do that la very late in the game. But making it real early is important. In fact, one of the big projects that I worked on for British Telecom was actually bringing broadband to every single customer in the UK. To do that required that you actually do something very simple. And that is move a pair of copper pair from the voice switch over to the broadband switch. Now, it's simple. In fact, it's done millions of times every day, I would imagine, around the world. But what we found is we contemplated doing that at scale and doing that without significant impact to customers. That became quite hard, especially at the pace that we wanted. In fact, we labored over this for months. And with our executive steering team, made up of not only the brightest, but the most senior leaders in the organization, we really struggled figuring out at what pace should we go? How broadly should we go? And what we found was we could never get consensus among that team. And we really struggled to understand why it was such a hard concept for something that was so essential, because after all, we did it at least hundreds of thousands of times a month. And one day as we were having our debates in the steering committee meeting, one of the leaders said, well, can't you just write the software and do it programmatically? And you know, that was a brilliant idea, except there is no software control over those copper lines. And it struck us, maybe actually people don't understand what we're talking about at all. We'd never made it real. So you know what we did? We did the best thing that our kindergarten teachers teach us. We went on a field trip. And we went into the bowels of one of the biggest switch sites in the UK. And it is massive. And what you, you, what you see is tens of engineers literally recabling from one junction point to another these copper pair. And as you interact with them, you find out this is not going to go fast at all. <laughs> and there is no way that you can write any software to help at all because it's still, the best was, you know, kind of wire wrap. And in some cases, it was soldering. From that point forward, you know, we discussed the task in a completely different way. If we had made it real months before, we would have saved ourselves a lot of time, a lot of agony, and probably a little bit of personal embarrassment. Okay? And that brings me to the last one. And I would urge you, as you dream your dreams, know what it's all about. Know what the outcome is. Know what your starting point is. Know everything that you can about your dream. And probably the simplest way to think about this is just to ask yourself the question, if you don't know your dream, why would anyone else bother? If you don't understand the change that you're inviting 
an organization or a community to take with you? Believe me, even if you get the invitation out, it won't be understood and no one will take you up on it. Okay. Had an opportunity one time to build a nationwide fiber optic network. And we were struggling in terms of going as fast as we needed to and of getting the basic stuff done. And it was really, really excruciatingly frustrating. In fact, one night we were up late, as had been the case for a number of weeks. And we were struggling with one of our remote sites that was required to finally tie together the last links. And we had a lot of our credibility riding on it. And we had a lot of dependencies we had to fulfill. And the manager running, running the project called up and he said, you know, we're going to have to push this off for another week. We built into the wrong portion of the building and the fiber is nowhere near where the device is that we need to connect the fiber. And if we, play, if we simply pull the fiber across, which we can do, we'll mess up the operational and in fact we'll kind of screw up the entire building for, for forever. <laughs> and so of course we about died. So we quickly called him up and we were talking to him and he's like, I just can't do it. I've only got you know, one or two guys there on, you know, on the night as planned. And, and as we began to understand where he was and what he was thinking, what we found out was he hadn't understood what the night's task was all about. He was missing one, one really critical variable. And that is his guys didn't need to, to move the refrigerator size component that some of the teams did, right? There was a seven inch device that his team needed to move, weighed about 30 pounds. When we actually became clear, we asked him to just verify with his team member what was on site, because after all, if you miss up where you're building it, you might have sent the wrong thing there anyway. And in fact, the team member said, oh yeah, it's pretty small, I could move it. Do you want me to? <laughs> well, if we hadn't known, or alternatively, if he had known, it would have been a complete non-issue. In fact, an hour later, it was all done. We easily met our schedule, but we could have absolutely had our project nearly die that night. Again, if you can't be bothered to know what it takes to make your dream real, to make it simple, to make it come alive in the hearts and minds of people, why should anyone else bother? Dream building is absolutely a team sport. It may not be a word, but it is a team activity. And the most fantastic thing about it is a lot of times it's like playing chess. Because you can't count on people being for you even sometimes when they say they understand. You have to invite them. You have to be in touch with the project and you have to understand what you're actually asking people to do in terms of taking on change. And it is a fantastic exhilaration to be able to work through change that actually matters, to be able to bring broadband to a, com to a country, to be able to truly bring some of these changes. Whichever your dream calls for, it will call for human change. So as you think through, how do you make that real? How do you make it happen? How can you make your dream come true? Plan on your most challenging thing, creating that team around you. Because without the team, your dream will not come true. With the team, not only will it come true, but you will change hearts, change lives, and have impacts around the world that you can't even begin to imagine. Thank you and good luck dream building. <laughs>